Happy Friday, everyone. Today is July 20th, and this is episode 41 of Get Your Tech On, our show on all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volp, founder of the Volp Firm and Nimble This. With us is John Downey, whose motto is let's pump you up. John is also CMTS technical leader at Cisco Systems. John, welcome back. Enjoy your drink there. It's always, it's always, great, always great to be back. <laughs> So today our topic is uh, talking about upstream levels when we get into Adoxus 3.1 levels, attenuations, higher frequencies, channel bonding, all kinds of things with Adoxus 3.1. But first, in the news, we have um, Cable Labs Summer Conference coming up, and that's going to be in, uh, from, in Keystone, Colorado, August 5th through 8th. Um, so they have uh, their... their uh, a bunch of track, well, two tracks really, innovation and technical. Um, so we've talked about Cable Labs in the past. Their summer conference is when Cable Labs vendor companies and also, or Cable Labs member companies and also vendors get together and really talk about the new technologies, what's happening in the cable world. Uh, we'll have a number of keynote speakers that are coming to the show, and we'll be talking about the latest trends and technologies, a number of featured speakers. It's a, just a lot of different seminars and uh, uh, talks that'll be going on. I, myself, I'll be talking, of course, about proactive network maintenance at the show. Uh, if you go to the Cable Labs website, there is an agenda. So if you're on the fence about going, I highly recommend going to the show um, a lot of good seminars that are going. John, are you uh, are you by chance going to be going there? Yeah, actually, uh, I am slated to go. I already got my itinerary. Get in Sunday, uh, leave Wednesday. Uh, the show is Monday and Tuesday, correct? Yeah. And yeah. it's it's uh, all tabletop, so there's not a lot of hardware. Uh, I'll be doing a demo of Doxus Predictive Scheduler, showing that in a remote FI system. So we have a remote FI system between Atlanta and our uh, Research Triangle Park campuses. And I'll be showing a difference, say, with a 2.0 type of modem, upstream speed and the delay uh, with and without this DPS uh, Doxus predictive scheduler. And it ties into mobile backhaul, you know, low latency applications, grant sharing, um, and how we're going to address uh, a large uh, SIN, which is a converged interconnect network. So your digital fiber optic network could be a metro ethernet and very far apart with a lot of hops. A lot of delay, a lot of latency. So how do you address that? And how do you maybe provide a 5G mobile backhaul over a DOCSIS network? Excellent. So yeah, I guess we'll see you there at the, at the summer conference. So that will be an interesting thing. Uh, moving on to the talk that we are going to get into today, you want to give us a little bit of a primer on on what you have? Because I know you have a lot of slides that you're going to work into, but I don't think we're going to get into all those today. Um, so you want to kick us off on that? Yeah, and let's uh, give a um, an up or let everybody know that gets on the podcast. Like you'll send out a what a link, and we'll probably convert the slide to a PDF. Yeah, so what we'll do, if um, if you're listening to the podcast only, um, some of the content on the slides we'll have, what we'll do is we'll put a link both on our uh, Volt Firm slash broadband event page, and uh, also in the YouTube, we'll have a link under this YouTube video uh, that'll contain, that'll give you access to the slides themselves that you can download them for all the slides we cover. So, John, gonna go ahead and uh, kick it off. So try to uh, talk through the slides as well. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So I'll do the slides as we're going. And one, I guess, for the people that go to Keystone, the very first time I ever went to the Cable Lab Summer Conference a couple of years ago, I was driving in from Denver, which is a long drive, you know, an hour and a half, almost two hours, whatever it was. And I saw the sign for altitude. And it, for some reason, I thought it said 900 feet. And I, yes. it, it occurred to me it was 9,000 feet. So it's close to two miles high. So yeah, it can be uh, pretty high altitude and hard to breathe if you're doing anything strenuous. Yeah, the first time I stayed at Keystone, it was actually the winter conference I was at Keystone and it was quite brutally dry. So <laughs> it's, elevation's a killer there. So going to the slides, a um, little background, I guess, is we decided to talk about Doc. Just we won stream. 
had it because one, no one really has spectrum to even play a real and for three DMA with Natrium so, um, and in Latin America, I'm seeing it. In Europe, it's 65 already, so they're able to play around a little bit. Uh, in the US, 42, 40 megahertz, any, most systems are actually 40 megahertz. There's not much spectrum to work with. So for ATDMA, that might be it. But if I need to offer higher upstream speeds, I have a couple of choices, either update the spectrum or maybe DOCSIS 3 and 1, and I share the spectrum, and there's a new terminology called TAFDM, which is time and frequency uh, domain uh, division multiplexing. So you're allowing the 3.0 modems and the 3.1 modems to kind of share spectrum, but they're basically divvying up time. So your ultimate goal is to hit peak speeds, and that's what the goal is, is to maybe reach 100 megabits per second on the upstream. To do 100 megabits per second on the upstream, we would really recommend a 200 megabit per second aggregate pipe to, to um, uh, safely provide a 100 meg service. Uh, so the only way to do that is three one or eight channel upstream bonding, but you don't have the spectrum for eight channel upstream bonding. So looking at the first slide, we were showing you know legacy wise four ATDMA channels doing 6.4 megahertz apiece. Uh, 64 qualm will give you an aggregate of 108 megabits per second. So that could be used for DOCSIS 2.0 low balance or DOCSIS 3.0 upstream bonding. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So, so that's what we're doing today. We're doing four upstream channels typically for just, and these are SC qualm, we call our single carrier qualm channels in the upstream. And you're saying that's giving us 108 megabit per second. The TA FDM, what did you say that stood for again? Time and frequency division multiplexing. And what, so what's the benefit of that when we're when we're using both traditional SE QAM channels and OFDMA channels? How, how do we how do you say they work together? Yep. So instead of allocating dedicated spectrum for three one modems and dedicated spectrum for three O modems, you're letting the three one modems use the same spectrum as the three O modems. You're so, allowing the CMTS to divvy up time. So, so is the OFDMA uh, frequencies are they are they coexisting with the SC QAM channels? We're using the same spectrum, the same frequencies that, and they're both existing at the same time. Or how is that exactly working? Not the same time, but the same frequency. Meaning, if I have a single carrier QAM of 24 megahertz. On a spectrum analyzer, the next second you might notice that the single carrier qualm goes away, and the OFDMA just spreads further across the whole spectrum. Right. So what you're saying then is we can have our older DOCSIS 2.0 or 3.0 modems, they're on the upstream, not at the same time, but they're using the same frequency as our DOCSIS 3.1 modems that are using OFDMA in the upstream. Correct. Okay. I think I'm clear on that. So if you yeah. So if you look at the, so the first the first uh, bullet point was legacy. Second bullet point is cross-bonding. Cross-bonding is kind of a, a terminology I use, and it's been used quite a bit nowadays, about uh, using dedicated spectrum for 3.1, dedicated spectrum for 3.0.2.0, and then allowing a 3.1 modem to spread its data across both of those styles of upstream channels. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you look at the second bullet point, you'll see, Two single carrier qualms, and you'll see an OFDMA, but that three one modem can actually burst and do all of that at the same time. So the three one modems using both the SC qualm channels and the OFDMA 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 channels in the upstream, right? It, it's able to transmit data on both. So so Correct. why why wouldn't we just use that? Um, having the three one modems use the legacy ATDMA channels, the SC qualm channels, and OFDMA channels. Wouldn't that make more sense rather than trying to do what you were talking about when we're mixing in time OFDMA and ATDMA or SC QAM channels? Yes, you're you're jumping ahead, which is which is good. But if you look at my third bullet point, if you did the TAFDM, we're seeing that you can reach a higher peak speed, but not much. Uh, we're showing because of inefficiencies of time, whenever you have an upstream scheduler schedule for 3.0, then have to have a little bit of buffer time and guard time before the 3.1 can burst, you have inefficiencies there. Um, 
Now, granted, you might say, well, a 3.1, I could use spectrum below 15 megahertz that I was afraid to use before, but maybe at a lower modulation. Uh, I also, with 3.1, I have higher modulation than, I, than ATDMA, meaning I could do 512 qualm or 1K qualm if the MER is good. Uh, doing the math, we ended up with about 190 megabits per second aggregate. But if you look at my second bullet point with the cross bond, I can get close to 176. So 190 versus 176 is not enough for me to propose or promote the TAFDM. So I, I, would, I would like to propose that customers actually go with cross bond, dedicated 3.0 spectrum and 3.1 spectrum, and let the 3.1 modems cross bond, knowing that you have diminished the amount of total 3.0 and 2.0 speed by migrating those higher speed customers to a 3.1 modem. But that's gonna come down to how many 3.1 modems do you have in the field versus 3.0 modems. It's gotta be a, a, a point of inflection, right? Yeah, I think you're gonna be looking at what to, to your point, how many 3.1 modems you have out there. What What is the smallest OFDMA channel you can have in the upstream? We, we found that with our testing, you know, you have 25 kilohertz and 50 kilohertz subcarriers. Most people start with 50 kilohertz because it's easy, it, it's less subcarriers, but 25 kilohertz will give you more efficiency. So we have some recommendations about 25 kilohertz. You have a half megahertz guard band on both sides. Um, with 25 kilohertz, the smallest channel, now, Smallish channel according to the spec is like six megahertz. Add in a half megahertz, like seven megahertz. Yeah. But it wouldn't give you enough speed for me to even mess around with it. So um, you, can, you can make a really small channel, but the question would be, do I do four ATDMA in this small little sliver of OFDMA? And does it really buy me anything? I still got to pay for licensing as well. Uh, the other question would be is, because I'm eliminating or avoiding five to 15 megahertz, maybe that's a perfect place to do the three one. But then on the flip side of that, I could say, I could argue that you're gonna to have to run lower modulation. So you're running a more robust, uh, te uh, um, uh, not technique. Um, modulation? Doxus three one, you know, te technology, more advanced technology, OFDMA in the lower band, but you might have to run 16 qualm and you're not getting much speed anyway. Um, so then, then the question comes down to, is it worth the trouble? Is it worth the cost? Um, I would like to see people migrate to, from 418 made down to two, and then use the rest of the spectrum for 3.1. But like we said, it kind of comes down to how many 3.1 modems are out there that can actually utilize that spectrum you just dedicated. Yeah, because I'm looking at your slide and you show um, two OFDMH, or I'm sorry, two TDMA channels and one OFDMA channel that's 19.2 megahertz wide. This is in a 42 megahertz return. Uh, but to your point, when you start out, would it make sense perhaps to have three ATDMA channels because you have a very small amount of DOCSIS 3.1 devices initially and a smaller OFDMA band? That would give you more speed to your legacy 2.0 and 3.0 modems. But then as you start to bring on more 3.1 modems, then you would, you would drop that third ATDMA channel. Now you're down to two ATDMA channels, and eventually as your DOCSIS 3.1 modems start to really increase, you could drop down to one ATDMA channel just for your, your few remaining DOCSIS 2.0 or 3.0 modems, increase your OFDMA band even more, and, and then eventually you'd migrate I, and I think that's what you're showing in your last bullet, where you, you have a really wide, 26 megahertz wide OFDMA channel and just one remaining um, ATDMA channel. So, is, I mean, do you I see actually, that being a, a migration yeah, over that, time? Yeah, yeah, definitely. The, and remember, you have to weigh all the options here. One, you're trying to hit a peak speed. What do I need to do to hit a certain peak speed? That's what it kind of comes down to. Uh, it's not aggregate speed. It's what is the peak speed I need to offer? You know, the, it seems like the holy grail was 100 megabits per second, a fast Ethernet type of speed on the upstream. So how do I do that? If I do three ATDMA with the rest of it being OFDMA, you might have an aggregate of 150. So offering a 75 meg service is, is doable. 100 meg service is doable as well, but you might be limited to how many customers could actually do 100 meg on a 150 aggregate pipe. And remember, you got to share that with everybody else that's doing 10 meg 
and 15 meg and 20 meg or whatever. The, the reason why um, I like going down to two ATDMA, think about, and you know this, upstream max transmit from a 3 modem. When you go from four upstream bonding to two, you gain 3 dB in the modem's max transmit. Yes. But if you go to three, three is the same as four. So dropping from four to two actually gains you a little bit more power from the modem itself if you have power level issues. Yeah, but you do lose you do lose some of the, the total capacity on your 2.0 and 3.0 modems that you'll never be able to pick up with the OFDMA channels. So I'm just I'm of kind of looking of at the systems that have a mass deployment, a massive deployment of 3.0 modems, most likely. And and yeah. just adding that OFDMA channel, they may have a a very limited number of 3.1 modems. So maybe they're just trying to see, well, in the upstream, will my 3.1 modems even bond to the OFDMA channel? It could be just from a testing perspective. So I'm yeah, looking it at it from that standpoint. It could be per service group. Yeah, absolutely. It could be per service group, right? You know, you have a new greenfield development and it's a college town or a new new development and you're like, you know, most of these are all new people, so I give them all three one modems. But that, the rest of the yeah. network is a lot of three in that case, them. In that case, it's sort of a moot discussion. <laughs> we can just go all OVMA <laughs> in that area. <laughs> so. Correct. Correct. <laughs> so I mean spent a lot of time on the first slide. <laughs> that was a 42 megahertz system. If you go yeah. to the next slide uh, in an 85 megahertz system, uh, you have a lot more spectrum to work with. So I mean keeping four ATDMA and doing the rest with DOCSIS 3.1 spectrum uh, and cross bonding, uh, the speed, the aggregate speed is close to half a gig. Now, if you were to do TAFDM, uh, you're still only getting maybe 50 meg more peak speed because of the inefficiencies. So I, I really don't feel it's worth it. You know, the other reason why I like having dedicated spectrum for 3.0 and 3.1 is the RF techs. You know, they're gonna have a spectrum analyzer. They're gonna be looking at this thing. If you have 3.1 and 3.0, at different time periods, it's really hard to kind of troubleshoot, you know, and looking at a spectrum analyzer. Yeah, so I think 85 megahertz plant is really a, a totally different scenario. I know there's there's a number of 85 megahertz plants in the U.S., but it's not. It's, it's certainly far from the majority. Uh, Europe and other parts of the country have a lot of 85 megahertz plants uh, or 65 megahertz plants, return plants. So they have a lot more options. And I think that's really what you're presenting here are the options that you have when you have a 65 or 85 megahertz return plant, where now you can keep your four SC QAM channels. You can have a lot of bandwidth for your legacy modems. And now you can add a lot of OFDMA space um, in there for your DOCSIS 3.1 modem. So I think this this can kind of paint a different picture from the previous slide where we didn't have much space for OFDMA, but when you have a 65 or 85 megahertz return plant, we can we can keep the ATDMA, we can add the OFDMA, and now you, as like what you're showing, we can get peak speeds up to half a gigabit per second in the return. And that's that's pretty exciting. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it's... Uh... Uh, it, it's where I see people going, especially in the U.S., is 85 megahertz uh, for now. Um, you and I were also going to talk about FDX versus 204. You know, another option with DOCSIS 3.1, the 204, 254 split. Uh, but then FDX came along and people were like, well, should I do 85? Should I do 204? Should I skip to FDX? If I do full duplex DOCSIS, I have to get rid of diplex filters and maybe have to do a lot more hardware change out. Um, even two like voters. So there, there are some pros and cons to that that we can talk about. Um, but before I even go into you know further up to 204, uh, looking at the options of TAFDM versus cross bond, my money's on cross bond uh, for now. Uh, but it obviously comes down to weighing uh, the cost, the, the peak speeds you need to provide. Um, and licensing and spectrum allocation and operational um, monitoring, uh, stuff like that. So uh, the other thing I forgot to bring up, Brady, was if I take my single carrier qualms from four down to two, not only do I gain 3 dB in the max transmit from a 3 modem, but you also save on downstream map traffic. Every upstream in a MAC domain, a cable interface, will eat up probably more than a quarter mega megabit per second or a quarter megabit per second for downstream maps. So if I have four ATDMA 
and one single carrier qualm, that's five upstreams. Five times 0.25 is 1.25 megabits per second. Um, you're going to have more overhead on the downstream on every primary downstream. Now, what's saving me is customers seem to be dropping the number of primary downstreams now because two of modems going through attrition. Uh, if you're doing 16 single carrier qualms on the downstream, maybe only eight are primary. Um, so just keep that in mind as well is if I drop the total number of upstream channels, it doesn't matter how wide they are, but number of channels, I actually save on downstream overhead. Right. Make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, but it is it is interesting now you're because you are talking about uh, sort of a recommendation to start changing the uh, downstream channels from primary to secondary channels in order to imp improve efficiency, right? And and I think this Correct. is something for a long time was it was not something seen as a huge benefit, and now we're seeing that it is becoming a benefit to change from primary to secondary Correct. on the SC qualms. Yeah, so. I mean it, it doesn't sound like a lot, but if you had 24 primary single carrier qualms, you're losing close to two megabits per second on each primary. Two times 24 is 48 megabit per second. You lost that's from a whole, your aggregate. That's point. a whole. That's a whole channel. That's a whole SC qualm channel. Yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah. Yep. So uh, moving on, that was uh, TAFDM versus uh, crossbond. Then we kind of get into. Um, what is the problem or potential problem I foresee with higher upstream spectrum? We all know that higher frequency creates more attenuation and coax. Now, the graph I'm showing here was uh, some help I had from Chris Leghorn, a guy on a colleague in my group. He's based in Lawrenceville, the old SA camp campus uh, in Lawrenceville, uh, off of Sugarloaf in Georgia. And they have a temperature chamber there, and they did some testing out to 85 megahertz. Now, this is kind of an extreme case where they did a 5 amp cascade, 7,000 feet of uh, half inch coax, which nowadays, you know, networks are N plus one, node plus one, node plus three. So you're not getting 7,000 feet of coax anymore. But this was kind of worst case scenario. And it kind of fell in line with what I've always believed and always heard was at 42 megahertz with. Uh, uh, biannual, diurnal, diurnal, diurnal temperature you know what changes. Happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Daily, seasonal, all that. You could have usually plus or minus 3 dB at 42 megahertz. Yeah, and, and I sure think enough, that plus or minus 3 dB. Yeah, plus two, minus three. Yeah, plus two, minus three is, is really always been the expected temperature change that we have um, uh, built into amplifiers. That's what the thermal equalizers in amplifiers are compensating for. That's what they're supposed to compensate for at 42 or 44 megahertz. So, what and what you're extrapolating for is up to 85 megahertz, or, or what's that? 84 megahertz? Is that what the test is? Yeah. Well, well, it's the line is at 85, but the the plot was at 84, but uh, the red line is at 85 megahertz. Yeah, and it, it's showing. And it's so not even now, now yeah, we're going exactly. from uh, plus two to Pollution. minus three to this, plus five to minus five. So it's it's quite a significant change that we that and, and what what we're seeing here now is this is yeah, the modems will have to over will have to overcome that delta when they're transmitting Correct. in the upstream. Correct. So my point with this is this was actual testing in eighty five. Could you imagine extrapolating this out to two or four? So has someone done that and? It's pretty, pretty <laughs> yeah, easy we're, calculation. We're, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know that the 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 transfer curve for coax is a square root function, right? Yeah. Uh, L1 over L2 equals the square root of F1 over F2. Right. So there's a formula for that. But if you draw it out, you'll notice there's a big bathtub effect at the lower frequencies around 100, 200, 300 megahertz. After 300, 400 megahertz, the transfer curve of coax attenuation becomes very linear. But in that lower band, that's where it's really bad. So me going from 85 to 204 could be like the worst area uh, for temperature swing, for attenuation differences. So yeah, we we can do all this with MATLAB and, 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 and theory, but then also testing it and seeing what's going on. Yeah, so and, and that's also part of, uh, I mean, without getting too far into FDX, but 
full duplex docks is we'll be using the return band up to 600 and some megahertz for the modems transmitting in the return. So that's even well beyond 200 megahertz. And that's one of the challenges exactly. that, they, that the full duplex docks is, has to face. So, so there's a couple things that, so I, I bring up the bad news first, meaning, you know, make sure we take into account there's going to be more attenuation and coax and there's going to be more fluctuation with the temperature swings yes. at higher frequency. On the upstream, we don't have AGC. On the downstream, we have AGC, automatic level control, automatic gain control, and amplifiers. In the upstream, we don't have that. The only thing we have is long loop level control between us. But how much do we really have, right? How much wiggle room do we have on the CMTS side before modems are maxed out? You know, you could even make the argument to say, what is wrong when it gets cold out? When it's winter time, there's actually less attenuation. So the modems actually transmit less. So isn't that a good thing? It's a good thing for the modems, but what about houses? If there's less attenuation in the cold months, then all the noise from the low value taps, all the houses off the low value taps, the whole noise floor in the head end is going to go up. Right. So how do I control that? So in, in the 85 megahertz equipment that they're making now are the 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 uh, thermal 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 pads in a return or the thermal equalizers in a return, are they correcting for more than just plus or minus three? Yeah, so that I would definitely recommend that we go thermal EQs in the upstream. That would help, especially on the cold days, to you're you're trying to make the equalizer, there's less loss in coax when it's cold out. So instead of being a certain amount of loss in the coax, uh, it would be less. You want the equalizer to actually go back again to create more loss uh, at the higher frequencies. Um, so the, yeah, the thermal equalizers would help on the colder days. And on the hotter days, you're going to have more attenuation, which will help attenuate oh, noise. noise. Yeah. Yes. But, but it's going to be a problem for the transmit. The yeah, the modem Correct. has to transmit more power. Yeah, so we have to design our modem transmit levels better. I propose that when we look at modem transmit levels, we plot them in a bell curve. And instead of being a wide bell curve, we should be designing for a bell curve of plus minus 3 dB, a 6 dB window bell curve, and center it up close to 48 dBmV. 48 dBmV median would give me 51 max and 45 min. Um, but with that said, to do that, I need special equalized taps. I don't propose to step attenuator taps anymore because if it's a step attenuator, it's a diplex motor. Right. A step attenuator has to step off somewhere. And that step is going to You don't change. want that because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's going to create group delay. It's going to create group delay. It's got to change to 85 or 204 or FDX. So why not just do an equalizer from 5 to 1.2 gigahertz and be done with it? Right. So anyone who hasn't caught up with our podcast is watching our older ones, listening, hey, we recommend these step attenuators. You can just ignore all that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah. doing the equalized taps would help create modems to transmit almost the same level, whether off a 26 tap or a 4 dB tap. Because inside is an equalizer to make that four tap look like it's more, you know, at lower frequencies. Yep, makes sense. With that, with that said, I looking at temperature swings, especially at 204 megahertz and up there, I'm recommending that uh, 48 plus or minus 3 dB for the lower value taps or, or, or the high value taps. But when you get further out, you're going to have more coax from the end of line back to the laser, whether that laser is an RPD, a remote fi device, digital laser, or an analog laser, uh, there's gonna be more coax, which means more temperature fluctuation. I really feel like I should be designing my end of line taps for uh, 46 plus or minus two. That way the max is 48, and even on the hot days, maybe it puts it up to 50 or something like that. You understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to build myself a little bit more range on those far away modems that are going to incur more fluctuation from temperature effects. Sure. Makes sense. So what's next? And the, the other good news is 
three one modems have more transmit power than three oh modems. Uh, so what is the max uh, transmit it, on the three one modems? I know it's higher. Yeah, if you look at a three one modem, the spec says sixty five dBmV total power uh, at a one point six megahertz equivalent. So we had to set like a baseline so we can compare apples to apples. And the Doxus three one spec said let's compare everything to one point six to have a baseline. 65 dBmV total power. If I take a 1.6 and do two, I drop by 3 dB. Four, drop by 3 dB. Eight, drop by 3 dB. 16, drop by 3 dB. So you see, you know, the math, 10 times the log of, um, of my bandwidth divided by 1.6. So, so it's similar it's a to a 3.0 there. modem where if you just do, are doing one channel bonding in the upstream, it has a, a max transmit power of I think like 54, and then if you do two-channel bonding, it drops, and four-channel bonding, it drops even more. Except with a 3.1 modem, you're just starting off about 10 dB higher than a 3.0 modem. Yeah, if let, let me give you an example. A 3.0 modem doing 64 qualm, four-channel option bonding, the max output is 51. That's 51, 51, 51, 51. That's four, four channels doing 51. Technically, that 51 total power would be 51 plus 6, right? Because it's four channels. So 51 plus 6 is 57 dBmV total power. Well, a 3.1 modem can do 65 dBmV total power. So technically, that's 8 dB higher power from a 3.1 modem compared apples to apples to a 3.1 modem. Does that make sense? Yes. And and but we're going to need that because the the loss the attenuation from forty two to eighty five or more importantly two hundred four megahertz is how much about at least eight dB lot. more <laughs> if not more so so it, so it's not just the higher loss because we're doing higher frequency what happens when you do more upstream spectrum yeah you're dropping you're, three dB every time you double the spectrum. every time you double the power or double the the bandwidth yes yeah. So even though I have 8 dB more power from a 3.1 modem, if you go from 4 to 8 channels of equivalent spectrum, that plus 8 just dropped 3 dB right there. If you go 8 channels of spectrum to 16, we dropped another 3 dB. So we're still safe because I had 8 dB of headroom to kind of work with, with a 3.1 modem, right? So, uh, but then what about the attenuation from the higher spectrum? <laughs> so it, it all comes into play. Yeah. Have you seen any plants that are at 204 megahertz and running three not, modems in the upstream? Not yet. Uh, we had a customer from South Korea come down, uh, South Korea Broadband, SKB. Uh, they, they came and we did a demo for, of FDX for them, and they said they're looking at a, a 200 megahertz. I think it was like one, it was weird. It was a 177 megahertz upstream, which I've never heard of that split. Um, We're and getting pretty close I, to 204. I told them, I said, Yes, exactly. And I said, you know, do you guys use, still use an analog laser? Because you, you know, and I know, an, an analog, analog laser, laser is bad. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, I, and I told, me and Ron Rannick talked about this, and I told him, I said, remote phi or digital laser is inevitable. He's like, well, it's not inevitable for everyone. I said, I meant it's inevitable if you plan on doing a super high upstream spectrum. You're not going to do an analog laser with 204 megahertz upstream. Well, I don't see it yeah. happening. Conceptually, you could try. I just think it's <laughs> gonna be really painful, and <laughs> really ugly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we have we have EDR, which is Enhanced Digital Return. Remember the BDR, Baseband Digital mm -hmm. Return? Yeah. So you can digitize the upstream for 85 megahertz, but I've never seen anything yet for anything higher than that because I think it would be cost prohibitive. It's a very expensive Why not just go to a digital converter yes. to do that. The ADC. Correct. Exactly. So why just get rid of the analog link and go to real digital, yeah. you know, a real digital link, you know, and, and which proposes RPD. That's what that's R5, proposing remote. That is what RFI is for. Exactly. So here's the other good news about going to remote fi is when you do designs, you design your taps and your modem transit levels based on certain input to amplifiers. And you remember probably, we would design for maybe plus 17 at the housing of an amplifier. Mm -hmm. And then as we started doing more and more upstream spectrum, some 
they'll start lowering it to say 15 or 14, you know, to kind of make up for the fact that the modems weren't going to transmit as much when you do more upstream bonding. So they kind of just wiggled around. I mean, unity gain is unity gain. And you just kind of, <laughs> it's either 17, 17, 17, or it's 15, 15, 15, <laughs> still a unity gain. Um, when we do remote phi, if we get rid of all the amplifiers, it turns out because you're putting the upstream chipset, Broadcom, TI, whoever it is, out in the field, the upstream level desire there is a lot less than if it was a analog laser or an amplifier. We don't need plus 13. We really need zero. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Yeah, and that's strictly from the standpoint that you're you're not going to have any degradation of the signal from the analog link. You're right, you're effectively right at the CMTS, even though you're not really at the exactly. CMTS, but you're at the demodulator. You're at the place where the chipset is going to demodulate that RF signal, which it needs that it the level of so, roughly zero. So, so let's we, say we can demodulate. Let's say that. the upstream chip, let's say the upstream chip is in the lid of the node and it needs zero. And the internal loss in the housing of the node, which is the amplifiers and everything else, has five dB. Seven, five or seven. Yeah. So technically, a tap right off the node, a modem going into the tap, it's going to need at the housing of the node plus seven. That's a far cry from 13 that we used to need. So we just gained 6 dB in range from what the modems need. Which. Which then, going back to our previous conversation, allows us to have a modem with that can overcome the higher attenuation levels, the higher uh, variation of diurnal changes that we were talking about. So remote phi does allow us to exist, have modems exist in an 85 megahertz plant, even a 204 megahertz plant, um, provided it doesn't have to have those higher transmit levels going back to the head end if we have the remote phi out in the field. Correct. Where's it picking Correct. up on those and That was kind of my concern. As an RF guy, I was concerned. I was like, how the heck are we going to do 204? And then how the heck are we going to do 500 megahertz on the upstream, let alone 204? We're you moving know, the chipsets like, closer I'm, to the modems. Okay. Exactly. So all of this is kind of coming together. The 3 modems have more power. We're moving the upstream chip from the CMTS closer to the modems. And we're eliminating coax. I mean, overall, and, that's one way to link. fix all this is get rid of coax. Yeah, yes, remove the analog exactly. link. That's, a, I think, a key important part there. So I, I, I'm, here's my potential attenuation fixes. And the first one is kind of facetious. Uh, get rid of coax. <laughs> that seems to be a no sacrilege, C right? I'm HFC. a HFC guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's more F and less C. Yeah, more F, less C. <laughs> so more fiber, uh, less coax. Um, Use of thermal EQs, that will help stabilize the negative fluctuations on the colder days, keep that noise floor a little bit lower. Uh, utilize uh, three ohm modems with the extended power. So Cable Labs had an extended power ECN they put out, so they'll put out a little bit of power. Three one modems have more power than a three ohm modem, so that helps. Um, and equalized taps, so designing properly with the equalized taps, doing a remote phi, uh, that obviously helps. There was another idea, and you remember Paul Brooks, you know, our, our mm -hmm. buddy Paul Brooks, oh, yeah. and I think he retired from he retired from Charter Time Warner. Uh, and his idea, he brought it up when I was talking about this a couple of years ago in SCTE, was an idea of creating an upstream AGC based on the downstream AGC circuitry. I'm like, yeah, that's not a bad idea. You know, look at the downstream AGC, and everything's kind of relative to each other. Uh, you know how much change happened at a downstream frequency, you could just do the mathematics to say, well, this is what I would calculate would happen at the lower frequency. Right. And you could have an AGC circuit driven by the downstream circuit, downstream AGC circuitry. But now you're talking about new amplifiers, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the only, I guess the downstream, you're looking at the pilot um, coming from the downstream, you're making assumptions based on that, you know, assuming that well, other amplifiers have changed levels or we're remaining constant on that. Uh, the, the potential downfalls that you would have is if your downstream pilot is lost, um, you, you <laughs> screw with your, your down, up, downstream levels. Now you're also screwing with your upstream levels because you lose your downstream pilot or your downstream signals. So True. I, but really, I, I think we're overall, trying to evolve to less amplifiers, right? 
yeah. We're trying to evolve to less amplifiers. Yeah. But but overall, I mean, the concept, I think, for the most part, is, is fundamentally sound. It's going yeah. to compensate for a majority. Most of the time, I think it's going to work. <laughs> when it fails, so the, the fail other hard. kind of cute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the other, the other uh, points I had for you know, looking at 85 megahertz, 117, 204, and eventually maybe FDX. Um, we, we talked about um, remote phi node uh, has lower upstream inputs, uh, recommended, recommended inputs, which will help us. Um, Cable modems at the end of line taps have more total coax. So I mentioned that. Not only am I concerned about temperature fluctuations because of all the coax loss and the temperature fluctuations, but what about, what does the spec say is legal for the tilt of those upstream channels? Do you know what that is? Because the modems will transmit whatever they need on each channel to get back into CMTS at say zero. So we know the modem is going to transmit different levels at different frequencies. Yeah, I'm pretty so sure it's, how it's much plus is or minus uh, 1.5 dB within the uh, the channel. Or it's a it's a you're talking about within the, the so channel I'm, band. I'm talking the spectrum. Yes, the whole spectrum. Yeah, and so I don't know what what it is within an OFDM A channel in the upstream within an SE QAM well, channel. I'm talking about I'm talking about. Uh, in it's called the TCS, right? The transmit uh, channel set. Uh, yeah. Uh, meaning all the channels from one channel to the next to the, to the last one. So I could have a channel, a single carrier qualm at 15 megahertz, and then OFDMA goes all the way up to 204 megahertz. Yeah. How much tilt can I have in there? I don't. I don't know what that is. So it, this is I'm setting you up. I'm setting <laughs> you up. <laughs> I know what it is. Oh, I want to know. <laughs> so what is it, John? So it's called the dynamic range window. Mm -hmm. The dynamic range window is 12 dB. So I, I ran some numbers on a 204 megahertz system with temperature fluctuations and all that. And I easily could see 8 to 10 dB of tilt. And that's assuming a, no impairments. <laughs> correct. Uh, correct. Exactly. <laughs> no roll off at the low end or high end or whatever. Uh, this is just looking at, you know, attenuation and coax and a certain amount of coax. Uh, maybe RG59, 100 feet, and a half inch, uh, uh, drop, or a half inch uh, feeder yeah, line. So is that no, into the no subscriber? Trunk. Is that um, that's to the from the subscriber's drop to the head end in the upstream? Is is yeah, what, that's what, looking what, at the modem's transmit levels. Okay. So you have to deal with oh, the yeah. subscriber's home, the drop, anything, and everything in between. Yeah. So if if you were to query a modem and say, all right, what's your transmit levels at upstream zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the upstream channels, mm -hmm. and you looked at the differences in transmit level, that has to be within a 12 dB window. Yeah, because I and see where normally, you know, for, for ATMA, you see maybe one or two dB difference, right? And that's it. Yeah, because all the modems self adjust per the CMTS to get them to the same level. No, no. Yeah, to, yeah, to get the same level at the CMTS. Right. The CMTS but, wants to so, see but zero, what you're zero, saying zero, is that is the transmit level has to be the same? Within no, 12 no. DB the transmit level the, is going to be all over the place. For the receive level has to be the same within 12 dB at the CMTS. The Wait. receive level has to be at the, C, at the CMTS. Receive level should be zero plus or minus one. But the transmit level from the modem it has to be within 12 dB. Okay, that's that's where the 12 dB is. Yes. Yeah, so that's within the transmit level. And that will be all over the place once we get the higher frequencies over, a, over a wide bandwidth. So it's just one more variable we have to take into account. That's why I bring it up. Yep. And that's, all, that's also applicable applicable to OFDMA subcarriers. So you would look at the start yes. subcarrier and the end subcarrier, and they have to be within 12 dB of each other, even over a yeah, well, 200 be, megahertz frequency be, range. Exactly. And, and this is what kind of confuses me because the 12 dB dynamic range window, DRW, was specified for DOCSIS 3.0 up to 85 megahertz. You would think that we would have increased that for 3.1 going to 204 megahertz, and we didn't. So um, it hasn't been increased. So someone obviously thought about that for 85 megahertz, 
but maybe to keep the cost down on the modem side, they said, hey, we want to keep this dynamic range window to 12 dB, even though we might be going to 204 megahertz. Because if we go to 204 megahertz, we feel most networks will probably go N plus one or N plus zero, meaning node plus zero, and actually get rid of all a lot more coax. Maybe that was the idea. I don't know. Yeah, or it may just be a, a limitation on the the chipset that's in the modems that they can only they can only handle a dynamic range of 12 dB or something limited within that. Correct. Which, which like I said, to keep costs down. Yeah, <laughs> you pretty yeah, much exactly. fix anything with money. <laughs> with more power and more money, you can fix it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's just another variable we have to take into consideration is this 12 dB dynamic range window. If we're going to do a higher upstream spectrum, more attenuation, more tilt from the modem's transmit perspective. Um, the other kind of fix we have, kind of a band-aid for some of this, is the CMTS upstream levels can be manipulated. Like, let's suppose you knew the modem was going to transmit higher at 180 megahertz. Technically, you could manipulate the receive level on the CMTS to offset that a little bit. Like you could say, you know, my modems are going to transmit 3 dB higher, um, which could make them maxed out or could exceed my dynamic range window. I could set up the CMTS for that upstream channel to say minus three. It just receives now, granted, a lower granted, power, which allows your C correct. cable modem to transmit it at lower power. So now you can stay within that 12 dB window. Exactly. With the pitfall that now you drop 3 dB in your MER. Yeah, right? but what are you, what are you really you're... accomplishing? I mean, the, the 12 dB window, is, is, that, is that something inside the modem that the, the modem will not trans allow its, its chipset to transmit outside of that 12 dB window? Um, the CMTS would see that dynamic range window being exceeded and it might drop it from the full bonding down to half that amount or... So uh, now it's going to go, yeah, it's going to say, okay, you can't use these channels that are outside of the 12 dB window. And really, I believe, if I'm correct, the dynamic range window is uh, assessed at the registration of the modem, not ongoing station maintenance. Yeah, so, so it would only be at the initial maintenance, you know, when modems are first deciding which channels to utilize. So once a 3-1 modem decides which upstream bonding group it can use, it could end up coming up with half the spectrum instead of the full spectrum because the dynamic range window was exceeded. That's going to create some really unique troubleshooting scenarios for technicians that are scratching their head wondering, you know, why, why is it I'm not getting the throughput on this modem? Then they realize that it's only bonded to half the carriers that it should be bonded to. Then they're going to scratch your head saying, why won't this bond to all the carriers? So that yep. understanding that 12 dB bonding window in systems once they've expanded to a wider frequency range, or maybe it's even a 85 megahertz plan and it's still not bonding, they're not they're not necessarily initially going to think to look for roll off or or look for this dynamic yeah, window yeah, change because yeah. they they could be compensating okay. for impairments and compensating well, that, for those impairments in the pre equalization world we know that forces the transmit power up more. So I think that's going to be, that's a sort of a new thing for technicians to have to understand that this is sort of, this is new. <laughs> so. Well, well this, this is happening now, uh, even with uh, four or six channel upstream bonding, uh, even with four channel upstream bonding, if you have power level issues during the registration of the modem, uh, it could drop from four channel, try because the CMTS will decide, hey, you don't have the proper levels to do four channel. So it'll look for the next a smaller bonding group, two channel or single channel. And the misconception or the problem that occurs is monitoring the CMTS for its state might say UB, upstream bonding, but you don't know enough to look to see if it's doing four channel or single channel. Yeah. So it could be doing single channel bonding, if you will, uh, but it's never gonna get more than say 20 megabit per second or so because uh, it's doing single channel. And if it's doing single channel, it's actually starving out two other modems doing that single channel as well. Yeah, so actually, you know, where, I, where we see it happen the most is when uh, there's channel bonding occurring and the channel is really close to the diplex filter, you get towards the end of the line and the pre-equalizer is trying to um, compensate for the group delay. It's compensating for roll-off uh, for modems at end of line. 
because of that group delay, it keeps jacking up the power of that higher channel. Eventually you run out of transmit power, that channel goes offline and now that modem's in partial mode. And so, you know, people try to figure out well, why is that higher frequency offline? They look for impairments, reasons for it to be offline, and it's just run out of transmit power. You can't compensate for the roll off in the pre equalizer. And it's not because we're in, I don't, it's not specifically because we're in that 12 dB window. It's just because that upstream channel has run out of transmit power. But I think to your point, it's going to become much, much worse when we get to higher and higher frequencies. And we're covering a wider frequency band that all the channels are transmitting over. And we hit that 12 dB limit. I think, but I think the so, same, the same reason folks don't understand why we're, that channel drops off close to the diplex filter. It's going to be even more confusing when they don't understand why channels are dropping off. They're nowhere close to the diplex filter, but they're just outside of the 12 dB tr transmit window. Correct. So looking at, and I'll just cover the, the pros instead of the cons. I don't want to be too negative here. <laughs> okay. uh, FDX versus 204. So if you looked at FDX, full duplex boxes, there's no diplex filter. Uh, the beauty of this FDX idea is all upstream speed, offering a much higher upstream speed than what's available with very limited upstream spectrum. Because now your upstream spectrum eats into the downstream, but you don't lose the downstream spectrum. So the pros of FDX is one, you can support legacy set-top box out of band. So if you have uh, 104 megahertz for your legacy set-top boxes, uh, you can still support that even with an FDX solution. You can still support FM carriage, FM radio on your downstream because you're not just shifting your diplex motor, you're overlapping upstream and downstream with FDX, so the FM can still be there. Uh, some people are doing that FM carriage over uh, remote FI networks, uh, distributed access architectures, with cron back uh, doing NDF, NDR, yeah. and narrowband digital forward and narrowband digital reverse, digitizing the FM signal and sending it down basically. Uh, through this digital link for RPDs. Uh, you can achieve much higher upstream speeds. That's the number one goal of XDX is higher upstream speed. Um, you have short or no cascade and limited coax, uh, and it's better for upstream levels. Uh, so a pro of FDX, it's kind of a pro and a con, right? The con of FDX is, you know, you're not going to be doing node plus three. You might be able to get away with node plus one. We are kind of looking at that idea. Uh, FDX was really proposed for a node plus zero, but we are looking at a node plus one type of idea. So if we do that, we do limit the number of amplifiers. So you have a shorter cascade and less coax, which is good. Uh, is there, RPD is, stream input is, is the node plus one an, an FDX node? Because I've, I've heard about this where the, the node itself will transmit in both directions. Or not the node, but the active so, after the node. Correct. Correct. So it's kind of like putting echo cancellation uh, on the upstream and downstream inside the amplifier. It's a little bit more complex. See, the fiber node itself, is, you're already separated between upstream and downstream on the yeah. fiber. And, well, but but digital, normally in an amplifier, we have diplex filters, which would prevent us from having Correct. duplex communication. So I'm, I'm curious <laughs> exactly. about the, that technology that allows us to have, yeah. you know, are you, are you, the next are you turning the, the, are you able to flip the diplex filters or are there no di diplex filters in that amplifier? So there'll be no diplex filters. Instead of a splitter, and it might be a, a directional coupler, which creates a little bit better uh, isolation, port to port, or input output isolation, input input, uh, whatever. Uh, you understand. Uh, better isolation between upstream and downstream, but you still have no diplex filter, uh, but you have to create a echo cancellation on both sides of your amplifier, I believe. Whereas on the fiber node, you only have one echo cancellation. You cancel the downstream from from reflecting coming back in to your upstream. Um, so there's only one echo cancellation in a node, but on an amplifier, because you had diplex filters on the input and output, now I think you have to do an echo cancellation on upstream and downstream. I'm not entirely sure at this point. I like the idea because at least with using an FDX technology, if you can add amplification, it extends it extends the concept of FTX a lot more into into neighborhoods, into remote areas where, you know, with no cost plus zero, yeah, you're not going to be able to go <laughs> very far. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah, cost, it, yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. So that, that's kind of the, the pros of FDX. Um, 
you have no reduced downstream spectrum when you, even though you're adding more upstream spectrum, you're not reducing your downstream spectrum because you're kind of overlapping it. Um, uh, the, the pros of 204, no special cable modems. So you can think about this, the pros I have for 204 are kind of cons for FTX. So the pros for 204 is- You're no gonna keep it positive, modems. man. <laughs> I know. I, I don't want to say the cons, but you can kind of guess from when I start talking about the pros of the other idea, right? So the pros of 204 megahertz is no special kill modems, no special nodes with echo cancellation, no need for N plus zero, and you can still achieve about 1.5 gigabit per second aggregate speed. It's not bad. Because if I go to 204, you, you could do two 96 megahertz OFDMA blocks. And if you do the math at 1K qualm, you could potentially get 1.5 gigabit per second aggregate speed. In the so you could probably safely provide a one, yeah, you could probably provide a one gig service. Yeah. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, it's pretty darn and, good. So I mean, some people of, might look at that and say, hey. Yeah, yeah there's a, right? still a lot of technology challenges with FDX that I, I think people are trying to sort out. So I, I think there's there's a lot of, a lot of use and benefit in, in just standard DOCSIS 3.1 that needs to be explored as we as we continue yeah. on. And I think a lot yeah, of as an RF guy, that. yeah, and as an RF guy, you probably appreciate this too. Is if I do FDX, I I need some type of like ingress under the carrier technology for downstream OFDM. Yeah, we and we because in an FDX environment, I can't see the upstream because it's hidden. Well, and a, yeah, a key part of that, and we're working on that on the on the Cable Labs Proactive Network Maintenance Group, is making sure that with in the FDX world we have ways and visibility to see the impairments and challenges and problems that are happening when FDX is not working, because uh, we think that's something that's really important for us. Because we, you know, FDX demos and FDX working in the lab is great, but when it gets out into the real world and it sees taps that are corroded or have water in them or impaired cable, we know that's going to cause problems that are going to be really, really challenging to troubleshoot within the FDX world. So, as to your point, we need ways to see under those FDX channels that are constantly on and constantly changing directions. So, it's going to be interesting. Um, all right, John, we are at the top of the hour. That went real by really, really quick. Thank you for your time today. This was a good episode. Our next episode is on August 20th, and it's going to be on Cable Fundamentals 101 uh, with some of the new technology that we have. So um, we do our best to bring our audience cool topics and technology like this every month if you like the episode please do hit the subscribe button on youtube if you're listening on podcast please subscribe on your podcaster so you get our information every single month john thanks so much for your time today we'll catch you next month so so long buddy very welcome take care take care